Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome. Uh, my name is Susie Moore, and I am the Artistic Director of the Avalon Foundation. And on behalf of our board, our Producers Guild staff, and our volunteers, we welcome you this morning. Uh, before we do get started, I just did want to take a moment to recognize any elected officials in the House. Um, if you guys would stand, we'd love to give you a little round of applause and thank you for your service. Thank you guys so much. Yep. I know that's been a busy morning for you all. Um, I heard Tillman was a wonderful event, so thank you for coming here as well. <coughs> um, and so I just want to welcome you to the 9-11 Day of Remembrance. Thank you for spending the morning with us as we pause and pay respect to the memory of the thousands of Americans who lost their lives 20 years ago today. We honor the innocent men, women, and children that perished as well as the countless first responders, health professionals, and community, mem and community members that came to our aid in the days and years since that terrible and tragic day. Today is a day of reflection and respect for their lives and for the work that many continue to do to keep us safe and healthy. Today's ceremony is the final event in a series of community events that focus not on the past, but on the future. Our goal was to empower our community members and remind them that they can support each other in times of crisis and need. Our project began with a day of unity in this very space back in the spring. Dozens of children were challenged with coming up with the words and deeds um, excuse me, that they would do if called upon to support their neighbors in need. The day was full of joy and a reminder of the limitless capacity for compassion that our children share for each other, despite their different backgrounds and sometimes very challenging personal situations. Over the course of the summer, the theme, you are the help until the help arrives, was discussed with hundreds of community members. We held safety trainings and artists from all walks of life created the works of art that you see on the banners that are hanging around downtown and then in the entryway up there. Um, many of their participants were from our most vulnerable populations. Their pledge to care and support each other, despite their own daily challenges, was inspiring to see and a reminder that we can all be everyday heroes if we have a willing spirit. This very space that I welcome you today is a testament to our resilience as a community. It did not exist prior to the pandemic and it is another reminder of the power that we have when we come together. A huge thank you to the Stoltz family and the many others who jumped in to create this space in a time where we needed somewhere to gather together safely. Um, I also really wanna thank the project partners for the Day of Remembrance, including the Arc Central Chesapeake Region, the Arc of the United States for all seasons, and the AmeriCorps 9-11 National Day of Service project partners all across the nation. There's many events like this going on today. Um, and a special shout out to the town of Easton, Public Works for hanging the banners um, in downtown. We do have a little video that we're gonna show um, and then we'll get on with the program. And I did want to, where Dina, where did you go? There you are. Dina Kilman is the Director of Engagement for our local arch, ARC. Um, I think you came to me in January after we had been out here in the winter freezing doing our play and and you were like, can we do, can we partner together for a project? And your, your enthusiasm and joy and compassion that you have, not only for the community, but for the people that you serve is really inspiring. So thank you so much for um, bringing the Avalon in for all seasons, all of us to work together on this. It's been a really cool year. Roll the reel, guys. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Megan Cook from the Easton Town Council. And I'm Donna Vitello from the Easton Town Council. We all remember where we were on 9-11, but we will always have to remember the sacrifice that the women and men, the first responders, gave that day to the citizens of New York and to Pennsylvania. We must never forget the terrible tragedy that took place on September 11, 2001 that took 2,976 people's lives, 
On September 11, 2001, New York City police officer John Perry was set to retire. In fact, he had turned his badge into a supervisor just a few minutes before the plane hit the first tower. He pinned his badge back on his chest and responded to the tower. Six months later, his body was found in the rubble underneath the South Tower. Every American can remember where they were 20 years ago when the airplane started crashing into the buildings. Yeah, I certainly will always remember that day because our son was at the Pentagon when all of this activity happened. The American spirit responded swiftly and formidably. We showed the world the American spirit is not easily broken. And by the time I reached my car in the parking garage in Towson, we heard about the plane crash into the Pentagon. And at that time, I knew that this was not just a, an accident, that we were under attack. We can all remember where we were and what we were doing as we watched the attacks take place in New York, Washington, D.C., and the Pennsylvania farmland. We began to realize how vulnerable we were to criminal acts from those who sought to destroy our way of life. My thoughts then immediately went to my own family, my daughter, my wife, my son, and all those brave Americans who rushed into that fiery building who gave their lives that day. My brother, who's now an Army general, uh, was obviously in the Army on 9-11. Uh, for the next 10 years after 9-11, he was basically gone. He was in the desert hunting terrorists and protecting our freedom. The stories he's told me and the patriots that they lost I remember this day. Be sure to say thanks when you encounter one of the first responders or military personnel who stand ready to help anytime, any day. We give thanks to the brave first responders and prayers and thoughts to the families that lost loved ones. We remember those who have survived and are scarred by this event. But as we go forward, it's a lesson for all of us to remember we do have difficulties in life, but we are able to be resilient and overcome those. And we need to always remember the power of our country, the power of our people rests in our ability to come together. Let's continue working together. Let's continue the fight as Americans to make sure that that day never happens again but also to make sure that that spirit of unity, of hope, and of love continue, continues on as we move on as a people. We must never forget how our country came together to provide hope and comfort to all of those individuals affected by this terrible tragedy. The tremendous impact of 9-11 wasn't the day the attacks took place. It was the day after. That was the day our entire country laid down its differences the disputes, the arguments, the discussions, they focused around one thing. And that one thing is how do we come together as a country to address this new threat, this threat that had existed that we weren't aware of. At that moment, a call to service touched every household in our country, every community in our country. We came together. One of the things you should consider doing is, is volunteering, uh, helping your community. Uh, stepping up uh, in the way that uh, those men and women did on 9-11, uh, willing to uh, work for total strangers, help your neighbors. Um, it would make a long way, go a long way in helping remember that day. Hi, I'm Dina Kilman, the Director of Engagement for the ARC Central Chesapeake Region. Thank you so much for joining us today. The 9-11 Day of Service commemorates tragic events in our country that happened 20 years ago. We honor the people that were lost, we honor our first responders, and we honor our communities that came together um, on that tragic day and the months and years that followed. Over the course of this summer, here on the Eastern Shore, we've been having awareness events that reminded people what we do in times of crisis. We support each other, we help each other. We look for those vulnerable populations that need our special support just like we did in COVID, we reach into pockets of communities that may need us and need our assistance and our support. We look to the people with disabilities, we look to the elderly, we look to the people of color, we look to all those populations and ask how we can help. If you see someone that needs your help, please reach out. We certainly have been doing that in Easton and across the Eastern Shore. 
And this project just reminds us the strength we all have together. So again, thank you so much for coming out today. And I uh, hope everyone enjoys our ceremony and remembers together what happened, but also remember that your community will be here for you as the future holds before us. And as other crisis events evolve, we have the strength to come together and solve those issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you, um, Nick and Dina from MCPD for putting that together. It was really nice. Um, yep, great work. And now, please um, help me welcome Jonathan Rondo, President and CEO of Arc Central Chesapeake Region, who will begin our presentation. It is still COVID. Good morning, and thank you for being here. Today marks a significant moment in history, the 20th anniversary of the September 11th terrorist attacks. Many of us remember where we were 20 years ago today when we all bore witness to one of the most harrowing events we've ever seen. We were worried about those working in the vicinity of the attacks. We were concerned for our loved ones and those who rushed in to deliver people to safety. And as these events of the morning unfolded before our eyes, we were witness to incredible acts of bravery. That bravery is never to be forgotten. Today, on this day of remembrance, the country and its many communities have come together to honor the memory of the loved ones lost, as well as the first responders and emergency personnel who gave their lives so others could be saved. Today is also a day of community, a time to reflect on the heroism within all of us to support each other in a time of crisis. As Dina mentioned, over the course of the summer, we have discussed the theme, you are the help until help arrives. With hundreds of children and adults throughout the commu through community events, art projects, and safety trainings. Particularly to the ARC Central Chesapeake region, we know that vulnerable populations, such as people with disabilities, the elderly, and our children suffer disproportionately in emergencies and crisis situations. And we know that together we can all be heroes by reaching out and doing what we can to ease their burden. Not all emergencies are the result of swift catastrophic actions like 9-11 or even the global pandemic of, such as COVID-19. But in an emergency, we must ensure that our most vulnerable citizens are able to access the supports and services they need. We are called upon to deliver the same level of care and treat any issue with the same level of urgency as we would anything else. I would like to thank you for taking the time to learn the needs of the people within your community and how you might lend your strength and your support. Now, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Beth Ann Langrill, CEO of For All Seasons. Beth Ann's wealth of experience supporting people and populations during times of crisis is invaluable. And I'm honored that she's here to share a personal story with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you to everyone for being here today, especially the elected officials that continue to show up every time that our community needs something, in no matter what time we are facing. I remember growing up as a little girl, thinking that my dad was an invincible superhero. My father was a captain on the city fire department in Rochester, New York. In my friend's circle, he was the coolest dad because no one else could say that their dad made a living of willingly running into buildings that were on fire to save people. And I can assure you that when it came to career day in nursery school, no one's outfit could top what my father brought to the party. Some of the best nights that I remember were the nights that my mom would pack my brothers and I in the car and travel to the firehouse to see my dad. Back then, we were able to slide down the pole, watch some cable TV, and get a soda bottle out of that old vending machine. My brothers and I had a blast at Engine 7. 
And for me, even though I didn't realize it at the time, something big was happening with each visit. Engine 7 with my dad is where I learned at a very young age that love and fear could coexist in the same moment. To this day, I can hear that tone that would come across the PA in the firehouse when there was a call. My dad and everyone on his shift would race to the trucks. And again, I thought my dad was the coolest because he got to drive. But in that moment, I remember this incredible moment that would ensue. Such love and pride, yet being wildly aware that where my father was headed was dangerous. I remember yelling, love you, as the trucks would pull away, and my mom loading us all back in the car, doing an amazing job of normalizing any worry that we may have. Back then, there were no cell phones, so I would love to hear the phone ring and hear my dad on the other line when he returned from a fire. I'd ask him about the call, and I always wanted to know who else was there to help. I can't stand here today and recall for you the moment that I got it, but what I do know is this. I cannot recall a time when I didn't have the understanding that my dad had superhero friends, and they all seemed to travel with cool lights when they went into action. It extended beyond the firehouse. They were the EMS team, the police officers, the dispatchers, the doctors, the nurses, the techs. They were all in it together, supporting one another and doing their part. It was a shared brother and sisterhood that didn't require a language. And I knew that my dad was a part of this superhero community, the ones who put their lives on the line each day to keep us safe, to respond to the tragedies that we experienced as they were experiencing it right along with us. On September 11, 2001, we saw those heroes come to the rescue of so many. We watched as these superheroes rushed to the aid of those killed, those injured, and to the family who had lost loved ones in the towers, in the field in Pennsylvania, and the Pentagon. Like them, we as a country quickly turned to action. And I imagine, like in the town that I was living at the time, there were flags everywhere throughout Talbot County, a display of us coming together. In times of tragedy, we look for something to hold on to, a hope or a connection. Author, professor, and researcher Brene Brown would say that we are hardwired for connection. So it makes sense that we all show up differently. Our response to a trauma or a tragedy usually find us showing up in ways that make most sense for what we need to feel connected. For some, the innate reaction is to forget what once seemed important and mobilize ourselves to come to the aid of others. For some, it's to bury ourselves in the news stories and the coverage of the events as they unfold. Others bake. Some just listen. And for others, the tragedy simply leaves us paralyzed, unsure what to do, where to turn, or how to find that connection that they are so desperately craving. And unlike a broken arm that leaves us with a cast that is visible, when we struggle with loss and grief following any event, that need is invisible. We can't see the hurt that someone brings to the table. We can't see the hurt that someone brings to the table. The person next to you in the grocery store, the coworker in the office down the hall, or the child who's participating in an after-school program. Trauma and the after-effects of tragedy show up differently for everyone, and what triggers trauma can also be different for each person. Trauma's not a one-size-fits-all, but each of us will experience trauma in our lives, some more than others. And for some of us, there's that one moment when we see it differently. That time for me was September 11th. <clears throat> Brandon Buchanan and I grew up together, playdate after playdate, a wonderful time spent with friends. We played years of soccer. We had so many laughs as he would try to take me out using his cool moves on the field, even when we were on the same team. Our families were close, and I still remember the day that he and his sister announced at church that his mom was pregnant with twins. As 10-year-olds, we thought this was pretty awesome. 
But I also recall the laughs that we shared when we realized that his siblings were going to be 11 years younger than him, and back then we thought his parents were going to be crazy old by the time they grew up. We went to separate high schools and separate colleges, but our bond was our bond. We were all so proud of Brandon when we were told that he was moving to New York City and had landed his dream job as an equities trader. Back then, to be honest with you, I really had no idea what it meant to be an equities trader. I just knew it sounded really cool, and he was moving to New York City. At the time, I was working at a college outside of Cooperstown, New York, as an educational opportunity program counselor. My job was to advise 100 students, primarily from the New York City area, who struggled both financially and academically, and in many cases would not have made it to college without our program. And one of the things that I loved the most about my job was that throughout the semester, I traveled to New York City to recruit for the college program and to work in the Bronx running a gang diversion program with an incredible high school principal, Jackie Brown. I remember joking with Brandon at our family's Christmas Eve party in 2010 that we had both made it to New York City, just in very different locations. The morning of 9-11 started for me with my colleague, Cindy Rice, calling me to tell me that a plane had hit the World Trade Center. I ran from my office to the admissions office to stand with folks that I worked with watching the Today Show. And from there, I ran as fast as I could to the residence hall where my students were. I will never forget the sound that I heard when I walked through those doors. The wailing, the crying, the screaming as my students watched the news coverage unfold. The panic ensued as they tried to get a hold of their loved ones but couldn't. My job in a manner of minutes had gone from an EOP counselor to working side by side my fellow colleagues to provide crisis support to our students, doing everything and anything that we could do to try to get our students home, connected to family members, whatever they needed, we were there. I remember calling my mom at one point that day and in my very I have a job to do way, said I was fine and that I was right where I needed to be helping with the students. The call was quick and I got back to work. It wasn't until September 12th, in the midst of all that was happening, that I remember getting a call from my mom that my brother, who was in the military and was supposed to fly home to my parents' home on 9-11, had been grounded on a base in Virginia. And she was calling to tell me that he was coming to drive to me instead. I distinctly re remember putting up a fuss that I was fine and I didn't need anything. And I started to tell her more about what was happening with my students. She finally said to me, stop. It's about Brandon. He was in the towers. He left a message for Beth, his girlfriend, shortly after the plane hit the tower and no one has heard from him. They don't think he got out. Suddenly the world that I had known of being there for others who were affected by a tragedy now had totally shifted. I realized in that moment that my brother wasn't coming just to see me. He was coming to take me home to my parents' house so that we could all be together. All the crisis management training in the world could not pull me back from what I had just heard. I can still remember sitting in front of the television for hours when we got to my parents' house. That big blue leather chair that we all coveted in the family room became the place that I sat and would sleep for the next 24 hours. I couldn't eat, I didn't want to talk to anyone, and all I could do was cry as I sat latching onto any hope that Brandon was gonna be one of the people that they would find. But knowing in my heart that he was gone, Brandon and 657 of his Cantor Fitzgerald colleagues died on 9-11 when Flight 11 hit the North Tower, leaving behind his parents, his two sisters and a brother, his girlfriend and so many friends. I remember feeling the hopelessness and simply just the feeling of emptiness. It was the grief kicking in. And I learned that for the first time in my life, I was going to walk the path of someone like so many who was affected by the worst day in our country's history. There's no manual that anybody hands you, and it's hard. In part because many times we don't know what to do. Our inner pull holds us back, or we worry we won't say the right thing or do the right thing, or worse off, that we will find ourselves feeling vulnerable and exposed at a time when maybe the narrative has always been to be stoic and strong for those who need you. But here's the thing. In the moment that it happens, we may need something totally different than what we would have imagined. I told you earlier that trauma shows up differently for everyone, and some of us endure more than others. 
Six years later, Brandon's family suffered another great loss when his younger brother Cameron was killed in a car accident on July 21st, 2007. For all of us, we circled the question, how much could one family endure? Those of you that know me know that I have two amazing little men who I am lucky enough to have call me mom. Jordan is 11 and Brandon is 10. Jordan was named after our love of Michael Jordan. My youngest son, Brandon, is named after my forever friend, Brandon. And he will be, he will be forever connected to the Brandon Buchanan family for two reasons. He shares Brandon's name, and as fate would have it, he was born on the fourth anniversary of Cameron's death. Brandon stands for beacon of light. And while Brandon left us on that horrible day, his light continues to shine. 20 years later, the trauma recovery still goes on for his family and all who were lost that day. As we see many times, people have flocked to, who flock to support and wrap around the family tend to fade away. And in most cases with loss, the phone calls stop coming, the cards stop showing up in the mailbox, and people stop checking in as much. Grief and loss is one of the most difficult emotions to process and work through. Something that we tend to run from because we are scared of loss, yet our hearts reach to grief because the broken parts simply want to mend. When difficult things happen in our lives, we see someone we love in pain, we don't always know what to do or what to say. So sometimes we say nothing because we think it's too soon or it's been too long. Whether you're talking about the tragedy of 9-11, the death of a loved one, watching someone go through the loss of a job, a family member of a friend struggling with addiction, suicide, a mental illness, insert any difficult life event. Sometimes it's tough to know what to say and how to say it. But here's the thing, it's okay not to know. We're not always going to have the words and we need to give ourselves permission not to be perfect, to get it wrong without judging ourselves. We need to remember that the grace that we would expend to someone else is the same grace that we need to extend to ourselves. To remember, it's okay to say, I don't have the words, but I'm thinking of you and I'm here. And in the moment, they might not know what they need. When you think about a scenario where you're at a loss for words, I encourage you to allow yourself to feel vulnerable enough to say, I don't know if I have the answer that you're looking for, but I'm here and I want to walk this with you. See, the beauty of a community like ours, like so many, is that we are a community. Community is defined as a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. So it makes sense that we all feel pulled into our community in moments of celebration and tragedy. After all, what we each need is connection. I was so grateful that I had some time to spend with Brandon's mom a few weeks ago at my parents' 50th wedding anniversary celebration. Sherry's an amazing woman who embodies the strength and courage of no one else that I know. It's said through tragedy that while there is a hurt that cuts deep, there can also be a newfound courage. Sherry has the most courage of anyone. The best part of the anniversary weekend was hearing Sherry and my mom talk about how Sherry was going to spend today. My mom said, tell me what you want to do. I can be your person. And Sherry simply said back to my mom, Jean, you are my person. That connection has been so important in Sherry's healing. Remember what Brene Brown said, we are hardwired for connection. Think about it, when's the last time that you heard somebody say, this is my really close circle of friends because they always solve my problems? You don't hear that. But what you do hear is that this is my close circle of friends because they are here for me. They walk this journey with me, supporting me and showing up, and they give me the support that I need, even in times when I don't know what I need. We can be that support for people in our community and share our courage with them so they know that they're not alone. Because courage isn't always about fighting a fight or winning a war. Courage is also about allowing ourselves to feel, allowing ourselves to admit that we're struggling, allowing ourselves to reach out and say, hey, I'm not doing okay. 
That's the kind of courage that we developed as a result of 9-11. But sometimes we forget the kind of courage that's there right after a tragedy. So the challenge for our community is to remember to maintain the spirit that we are pulled to in different times. Please believe me, I'm not saying that you have to be on your game at all times. But if we can practice the skill of reaching out and connecting with those in our circle, it will begin to seem like a part of our everyday life. So in times of tragedy, our skills are available. When I was sharing the topic of my speech with a friend last week, she commented, resilience always shines through, especially with our children. I paused and I really gave that some thought. Because the thing is, we are all born with the capability to be resilient, but it's a learned skill and something that we have to nurture in our children, in our relationships with our friends, with our coworkers, and in our community. We have to take the time to stop and be aware of the impact that we have on one another and allow people to feel seen, heard, and valued as they are healing. After all, when we go back to that definition of community, it's about sharing in a common goal. A goal for a supportive, healthy, resilient community doesn't happen overnight, but it does happen one conversation at a time. September 11th showed us the act of hatred and fear, but it also showed us that superheroes are all around us. It showed us family and friends supporting one another. Our community is filled with resources like For All Seasons, Chesapeake Voyagers, the Mobile Crisis Team, and Channel Marker. Some of the most amazing men and women who serve, you'll find at the Talbot County Emergency Services, our local fire departments, at our police stations and sheriff office, the nurses and the doctors. We're here today because the ARC had a vision for how we could commemorate 9-11. Dina Kilman, Susie Moore, Geneva and Talbot County Emergency Services, Katie Tiki, Danae Spearing, and the staff at For All Seasons came together to dedicate a summer to the importance of ensuring that all members of the community are thought of and included, regardless of their disability, regardless of the color of their skin, simply to be there for one another. Making sure that we think about how we show up for the community, what we think, what we think with those folks who may have a physical or mental disability. Are we considering in them what they need in times of tragedy? I'm so appreciative and grateful for the team that has worked so hard these last few months. And I know at any time, they're only a phone call away. This day also showed us that nothing is promised, not one single day. So today, as you reflect over your last 20 years and look to the future of how you want to show up in your community, I encourage you to take some time today to reach out to someone you care about, someone who has suffered a loss. Pick up the phone, send a text, even if you think it's been too long. Give yourself the permission to be vulnerable to allow the stoic side that might be leading you fall away. Because maybe the strength that that person needs is to see that you too are human. Don't fear breaking down, let that emotion out. And maybe you're sitting here today thinking, I need someone to reach out to me. Give yourself the permission to say, I'm not doing okay. I just need to talk. We don't have to go at this alone, even when we think we do. And sometimes when we let someone in, we realized that we needed it more than we ever knew. Thank you. One of the things that we wanted to do today, because we are talking so much about community and connection and how we can show up as a community together, is open up some time for Q&A. And no one needs to feel fresher to ask any questions, but we did want to give that space to folks. Hearing none, that means I'm off the hook. <laughs>
Bethann, that was um, really moving. So thank you for sharing that personal story on a day when we could all use something like that. So really wonderful. Um, and this concludes our program. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, like Bethann said, reach out to somebody. Even pick a little bouquet of flowers and maybe drop it off for your neighbor if they need it. All right, thank you all so much and never forget.